Hello, it's Scott Manley here with episode 39 of Interstellar Quest. We have our famed avionauts, Sidzy Kerman and Dildred Kerman, flying over the surface of Minmus towards the pole. You can see the planet Kerman in the background there. We're just sliding around over the planet. Landing gear is down optimistically because, well, at some point we're probably going to have to use it. But I think we're going to try and land this on the tail since that proved to be such a reliable means of landing last, last time. Of course, we're going to the pole because we haven't gone to the pole of Minmus and that means we'll get more science. More science means more toys to blow my kerbals up with. 280 meters up, we're now basically falling vertically at about 7 meters per second. Uh, based on the previous landing, I should just be able to not do anything and land perfectly. But uh, you know, call me a bit of a, a stick in the mud, but I think I'm going to try and slow my descent a little using these engines. Seven, eight meters per second. Actually, maybe I maybe I should actually use my engines just a little. I mean, I get tons of fuel. I refilled from the uh, refueling station around the equator of Minmus. It's chugging away, mining out the ice and turning it into uh, hydrogen and oxygen, also known as liquid fuel and oxidizer. Um, well, although based on the densities of the materials used in the game, liquid fuel is probably more like kerosene RP1. But... Uh, yeah, uh, the real fuel mods adds the ability to switch between hydrogen and oxygen. And touch down. Look at that. Beautiful. Just touched and no more. Excellent. Now let's put it on to its front. Ooh, clipping those wings just a little. And... Oh. Wait, what the hell? My tailplane just fell off. But, 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 but it landed just fine on it. And then as it was leaning forward, the tail came off. That's, that's so unfair! Oh, well, Sidzy and Dildred Kerman um, have now got a space plane which has no tail plane. And anybody that knows anything about aerodynamics will tell you that's generally not a good state of affairs. Uh, that is a rudder, actually. Specifically, that is the tail plane, the vertical stabilizer plus the rudder. So not only do I not have any way to just, even if I had a static one, it would be fine, but now I've got no yaw control and I don't have any, well, yeah, he also doesn't have any ability to stand up. Uh, okay, I can feel the planet spinning beneath you. Suddenly you feel a little green around the girls. Gills. Um, well, you better get used to that whole spinning thing because I suspect that's what's going to happen when you try to land this thing in the atmosphere. <laughs> yeah, you're all happy with the notion of flying a, a spacecraft with no yaw stability. Okay, we're just going to take our surface sample. It has the consistency of a snowball. Oh, wait a second. Uh, it would be great to throw this at my friend. Yeah, there. It is likely to be just as good at being thrown into other Kerbal's faces. Site name. Um, uh, I hope that I can fly this thing without a tailplane, without a rudder. Um, yeah, so... Without a tailplane, without any vertical stabilizers of any sort, I will have no yaw control, which means I will need to be very careful with my angle of side slip. If it goes too high, then it's very likely I will end up in an unrecoverable spin. Good news is, I have a parachute on this, so at very least, whoever's flying it will probably survive. Bad news is... We're probably going to be carrying all the science in the command pod, and therefore, if we lose the aircraft, we lose all that wonderful science. So, this is going to present me with uh, an interesting situation, let's see. So, we're just skipping things forward, grabbing all the science, and doing some silly flying around. Yes, flipping onto his back there, all kung fu style. Grabbing all the science from all the containers... Removing all the data, loading it into the command pod, and there we are, ready to go. And because we're actually pointing in more or less the right direction, if you remember when I was landing, I could see the planet Kerbin off to my left. Uh, that means pretty much, since I'm at the North Pole, I should just be able to go... Oh, I'm sorry, it was off to my right. Right, so I should just be able to go straight forwards, and I will end up on a return path to the planet Kerbin. Now, given that I have tons of fuel. I could explore other biomes, but, you know, the damage to the aircraft means that we're going to cut this mission short, so... 
Get ready for liftoff. Look at this. I, I love this thing. It just f takes off as if it's a plane. <laughs> is my wings may have no power here, but that doesn't matter because my engines provide enough power for to do what I need to do. Okay, so we're just gonna make sure we get ourselves. Yeah, look at that. We're we're pretty much going right. We just need to uh, make sure. Though there's the first the first view of the planet Kerbin. Just going to flatten this thing out a little. We want to kind of come down close to the, the equator, right? I mean, the important thing to realize is that we're not going to go directly down. First, we're going to aero break. Then we're going to circularize our orbit. And then we're going to land. And it looks like I really messed up in my orbit here. <laughs> Look, at I, I really overcooked this thing. I have no idea what I was thinking, but... I uh, departed at much too high a speed and ended up going downwards like that. What was I thinking? Uh, so at this point, I realized that with two and a half days worth of life support left, uh, going up and then going down is actually going to kill my Kerbals. So I need to flatten this trajectory out, get it into an equatorial orbit, more or less, and kill my vertical velocity so that I actually am not going to fly up and then down again. I'm going to go straight down and into the planet Kerbin. So you see pointing my engines directly at the surface and there we go. So that's us. We're going to go straight down and, and it, yeah, you see I have to invert the whole orbit to bring it round again. There's a bit of uh, interesting stuff with the periaps height there. Uh, it's going to encounter the moon. A whole bit of adjustments there, but uh, pointing straight down, I accelerate towards the planet. That saves me a little bit of time, and I'm going to set my periaps at 40 kilometers, drop in my, uh, pull in my undercarriage, and then I get alerted that the Drez lander needs to make a course correction. Now, the Drez lander, as you know, is the slow boat. It's going slowly to Drez. It will land and it will hopefully have enough fuel to return with the science. It's not going to bother transmitting everything. It just needs that giant antenna, which is currently sitting, um, well, folded up simply because we, we're still concerned about remote tech. Yes, there is a fixed DLL, but the fixed DLL still crashes with my other mods. I'm sorry. I don't know what the problem is. It's going to be really fun doing this when I get to Duna because it doesn't have any of the stock antennas on it. So yeah, this one will get here in a couple of months, but we need to make the course correction now. And you know, even though there's a small gap between leaving Minmus and landing on Kerbin, I still have to manage these things. And so here we are, falling back towards Kerbin. And we're informed, helpfully, that we have less than 20, 12 hours of life support left for both of these crew members. So it's very important that we return to the surface as soon as possible. However, the timing of the return has presented an alternate plan to simply landing with this crew. Uh, we all know the aircraft is, without a tailplane, is dangerously unstable and can only be handled by the greatest Kerbal pilots. You may have also noticed that we're coming down near to Space Lab 1. Space Lab 1, as you know, was our environmental testbed uh, space station. It let us put Kerbals on them and test life support systems. And recently, uh, a, a new crew moved into it. A certain Bill, Bob and Jebediah Kerman. Well, it's possible that we could rendezvous with this station, with this stricken aircraft, move the crew and, more importantly, the science onto the space lab and bring across a more experienced pilot in the form of Jebediah Kerman. Now, perhaps he can land the aircraft, perhaps he cannot. But, more importantly, if we move the science off, then we can rescue the science, ensure it is returned safely, and Jebediah can still punch out using the ejection system. So we're just going to perform a run. We're just going to kill our orbit here. What we need to do is slow down as much as possible. You see, we've got a, our surface. We're in surface nav ball mode. Uh, we're just going to slow down in that direction. We have to be really aggressive about this because this is our one chance to rendezvous. It says our food is now less than six hours. Well, we've got less than six hours worth of oxygen now. So we're really pushing it. So with a bit of uh, guesstimating, and you see I'm firing the engines here in the fully time-accelerated mode, I come up with a rendezvous within about 12 kilometers, 11 kilometers even, right? So all I need to do is fly around to that, and then once I'm there, slow down all my, remove all my relative velocity, 
and uh, you know, stagger my way in and meet the guys in the station. So that is the plan. This is in t this was not planned by any means. This is a complete fluke that these things came down so close together. So I, when you see what I did here was I pointed at the nav ball. I started to do my rendezvous and I thought, oh yeah, I'll just burn my ret retro vector. Uh, and then I realized, oh yeah, I'm in the wrong mode. I was in surface mode instead of target mode. So I fly past the target at um, really rather embarrassingly fast. Uh, I only have a few hundred meters per second of delta V left, so now I'm moving in towards the target. Now that I've switched to the correct mode, I wasted about 300 meters per second of delta V on that uh, nav ball mistake. It happens. So now I'm coming towards the target, and again, we're down to... Our, our, our life support is unlikely to give out during this mission, but all the same, I can't afford to dilly-dally and take the slow approach. Now you see our delta V is down to 180 meters per second. The good news is we do actually have some reserve fuel on board so we can give ourselves an extra, you know, 100 meters per second almost. That will help. And uh, yeah, if all worst comes to the worst, we have monopropellant. We'd like to save as much, uh, as much as our fuel as possible because we can also use the rapier inside the atmosphere. And it's just a case of coming in towards the space lab, correcting our course bit by bit. And uh, this is, does not have the capability of docking, so we're just going to park the spacecraft within EVA range and then fly the crew over, carrying their important cargo of science. And of course, the the science itself will be returned on a one of these return capsules, right, which is more likely to survive than this. And so it's time. Dildred goes first. He takes all the data with him. We're going to entrust it all. Hopefully he doesn't float off into space with it. That would be really embarrassing. Then we'd have to rescue him. And yeah, it's just not cool. <laughs> oh, it's beautiful. I love rendezvousing. It's like the equivalent of parallel parking two missiles flying at Mach 5, right? <laughs> Uh, yeah, and of course, this is Jebediah coming over saying, I know how to fly this thing. Oh, it's an aircraft without a tailplane. That sounds fun. I mean, they really did build an experimental aircraft that did not have a tailplane because it was you know, for testing stealth technologies. I think it was the X-34, but I could be wrong. Now, it never had a tailplane, but it did have uh, an air jet system. So I had some way to divert um, thrust using air. So that would give it yaw control. This one, well, what we have, I guess, is we have yaw control from the cockpit. So it shouldn't be that hard, actually. All the same, I'm sure it's going to kill me. <laughs> uh, yeah, so this is, uh, is this Dildred? I forget the other dude's name. Ah, yeah, we never mind. It's Jebediah's turn now. Go, Jebediah. 84 meters per second of Delta V is what we have left. Thankfully, we actually have a fairly... F we have a full tank of liquid fuel, and that will be enough for us to um, fly quite a distance, actually, because the rapier engine will run in uh, air-breathing mode and be able to carry us around. Now, it just so happens that we're pretty close to our... our uh, to the Kerbal Space Center. So at the very least, if the aircraft spins out and you know crashes, then Jebediah won't have far to go when he's recovering the wreckage. So here we go, re-entry time. And once again, well, we don't have any vertical stabilizer here. So what's going to have to happen is if I start to yaw out of control, I have to rapidly roll it one way or another, right? to try and make sure that a yaw deviation, a side slip turns into a an angle of attack, right? It seems to be actually pretty good right now. We're just using the usual turning mode. We're you know, turning to slow the vehicle down uh, because otherwise it looks like we're gonna overshoot. We're not having too much trouble with the temperature here. If you remember, I have deadly re-entry set up so it's not really deadly, more just like dangerous. It is possible. To kill my spacecraft and it has happened but in this case we're not probably going to be okay we're more worried about flipping out of control here okay so now we need to make that turn very 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 carefully and i'm bringing up the actual far flight data systems right 
So the thing to watch is the side slip angle, right? If the side slip goes more than about uh, like five, six degrees, this thing is probably not stable under yaw and will get into a flat spin. And I, the only way I have to, to recover it would potentially be the RCS. Um, yeah, the RCS and, and punching out. Okay, so we've overshot by quite a distance and this thing is actually flying surprisingly well. It seems that the the torque from the cockpit is actually giving us more than enough control. Uh, you know, we're deviating by... Oh, there, the side slip went really high. Side slip went really high, but I uh, managed to keep it under control here. So we switched the rapier into air breathing mode. And so far, this thing seems to have flown surprisingly well, considering that the numbers say it should be incredibly unstable. And I suspect that really it comes down to the fact that that cockpit has plenty of torque and that is what's really giving us the control. So it really does beg the question, and at least Jebediah is asking the question, is it possible to fly this thing without the torque, the artificially strong torque from that command cockpit? And so I figured, what the hell? What have I got to lose? Yes, yeah, so let's turn off the torque. Make this thing a real aircraft. Now, now we have no artificial forces on this thing. It's going to fly like a real aircraft with no tailplane. Uh, granted, that engine, the rapier engine, probably has some sort of yaw control built into it. So that should probably help us while we're flying under power. It will, and then you see, oh, you see a bit of side slip there going on. So it becomes much more squirrely at lower speeds, and, and I have to be very careful. I thought about going for the nearest launch, and the nearest landing, the nearest runway, but uh, yeah, I'll just go for the main runway. It's longer and will give me more time to set up a direct approach here. I don't want to have to be bleeding off velocity like I would be here. So yeah, everything's... there's only fuel in the back here. I'm not sure whether... oh! Oh dear, not good. There's a bit of wobble going on there. So slowing down here. Now, so we're going to just try and get in. So yeah, the X-34 was the the vehicle they tested it on. And uh, it actually flew surprisingly well. It had a lower signature in theory. It maneuvered exceptionally well. It had uh, air jets and everything. But it never went beyond a test concept. Although I think, I think I've seen some drones that have no tails as a, a, the, a you know, theoretical thing. So I'm just coming down with the engines on and no more. I want to go as slowly as possible. The biggest danger is that I manage to... Well, the biggest danger right now is I actually stall this thing, but I seem to be doing all right. The biggest danger is that I lose control on the runway because I won't be able to correct yaw with the rudder when I get right down. So this thing is going to drift left and right, and I want to make sure my side slip is essentially zero when the wheels touch down. Otherwise, we could end up in a situation where I lose the aircraft on landing, and that would be really embarrassing. We're coming in really low here, and this is most... I know everybody says I come in really low. This is the way I like it. It's a lot easier to see where the runway actually is. And it means that I can, I don't need to flare and kill all my velocity and everything. This isn't, these things don't fly like real aircraft, right? Four, oh, come on, come on! Okay, no, 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 I gotta get down gently, gently. Just gonna be, a, I, I'm very afraid that I'm gonna lose it on landing, so I'm trying to make that as gentle as possible. 64 meters per second, and down! Jebediah Kerman, Thrillmaster extraordinaire, saves the day once more, landing an aircraft without any tail fins. Yes, for all you who ever doubted Jebediah, shame on you. I'm Scott Manley, fly safe.